Countdown. Two. Nine. That's not how the force works. <laughs> Hello, one and all. Welcome to another episode of the Countdown to Nine podcast. As we work our way chronologically through the Star Wars universe, one movie per episode, and we have exited the original trilogy, jumping way ahead in time to what some might call Disney Star Wars, with this entire show dedicated to Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. Paul Preston here from the Movie Guys with my good friend and co-host Sean Blodgett of the Tenacious and Powerful. <laughs> Creative motion entertainment. <laughs> That's right, baby. Uh, see. <laughs> That's all I got this week. Sometimes I That's get, right, baby. Sometimes I describe you with a with an adjective, and then you embody it. Not this time. No? <laughs> no. What tenacious. <laughs> That's right, baby. Sean Blodgett of the Vaudevillian. <laughs> That's <creative>. right, baby. <laughs> All right. It seems uh, so it's Sean, straight downhill from here, really. It's just that's luckily it. Luckily, we only have a couple episodes. That's left. But right. I can't believe we're, we're, we're doing it. Seems I know. Like I'm we're so excited. Going to get this done. Yeah. Uh, we got off course here and there, but I think we're going to get this out and then our last Jedi episode to follow. All that before The Rise of Skywalker hits theaters. To help us get there in this week's uh, episode is our guest, a film producer and director who has made the award winning short films Far and Dance of the Dead. He's also an accomplished editor with a ton of credits all over your cable television set, including numerous shows on E! as well as episodes of Attack of the Show, The Nerdist, and more. He also has some cool ties to the Star Wars universe we'll get to a little later. Brian James Crew! Some quick housekeeping, though, as ever. Please chime in your thoughts at themovieguys.net, countdown to nine at gmail.com, or at countdown to nine, pretty much all over social. And as ever, we check in on the road to the rise of Skywalker, uh, as we do on every show. And, and I have to tell you, with our guest here, no one does what we at the Movie Guys call the ramp up uh, to a blockbuster film quite as well as Brian Crew does. Oh, because oh, I'm so excited. He hosts movie nights with his friends and, and uh, at his house, and it's a it's a spectacular home <laughs> setup. And I went there for the John, like John Wick 3's coming out. You go to Brian's, you watch John Wick 1, you watch John Wick 2. It's true. And you are planning marathon Star Wars. We're in the middle of it right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we've done the prequels, and we did the Star Wars stories, and this weekend, which is, uh, we're recording this right before Thanksgiving, so that sa- the Saturday we're doing the original trilogy, and we've got the uh, 4K 77 and 4K 83 versions of uh, Star Wars and Jedi, so that's the 4K prints of the original releases. Wait, are you showing? Are you showing prints? Well, they're they're the digital prints, or they're oh. like files. Okay, you can get online, and yeah, I haven't. Put, but I now do have that. Would be hardcore. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like wow, he's got a f- what? Where do you? <laughs> where? What's the address? How do I? Don't <laughs> um, but yeah, and uh, but would you, I show them on a projector. We have a hundred and thirty-seven inch widescreen, two three five screen and a oh my God. nine or seven point two point two Dolby Atmos surround. Holy which is schnitzel. meaningless for the original. You know when there's a point two to your point two right. that you're really you've right. then you've really got something. You know what I have? Yeah. I have surround sound. I have that's, uh, that's the end you of my speakers discussion. around you. <laughs> I have sound. <laughs> sound is good. <laughs> there's, there's nothing wrong. There's a really the original Star Wars was released to mono. It's okay. Yes. Uh, it's okay. On our Return of the Jedi show, our guest was Eric Walker. Mm-hmm. Of oh nice the uh well, what do you want to call it? Depends on where you are. Right? We're doing Caravan the, of Courage. The Ewok or? Adventures. Yeah. Ewok he's Adventures. in both of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The second one very briefly. But they have a different name, right? It wasn't Caravan it's of Courage. Carav- was the English. British? Or? Yeah. Caravan of Courage was uh, British because it was released theatrically. And then here in the States, it was, I think it, I think it was ABC, and it was the Ewok Adventure. I wanted someone Wait, it was released the theatrically? Yeah. Wh- really? Yeah. <laughs> What, where have I been? What is happening in you the world? You weren't in England in 1985? Oh, uh, you know what? No. Norway. Ah, yeah. so close. <laughs> <But> Norris, <laughs> missed it by this much. <laughs> Norris. Behind, oh, behind so sad. Those. <laughs> yes. So not surprising you have your tickets already for The Rise of Skywalker. I do, for the opening Thursday and the following day. We got opening Thursday. I'm so excited. Yeah. We can't quite. Where, where are you guys going? Arclight, Hollywood. Yeah, Arclight. Well, which, which time? 10.45? I wouldn't oh, say it I'll like that. At 8 o'clock. You can't right. say it like, Arclight, Hollywood. Arclight, Hollywood. It's going to be so great. Yeah, but. It's also a given. If you're really, I mean, you gotta go there to see. No, these. that's actually, I, it's my second choice. Oh, really? I didn't want to go to the Arc Light Hollywood opening night. Uh, I wanted to go to the Chinese. Of course, yeah. Chinese. Of course. It's not a Star Wars film until I've seen it at the Chinese theater. Ooh. But uh, the open, the first show was at six, and not everybody can make it from their job. 
and I do go with the. I have groups, but like the, whole, the people who watch it in your house all go out as a group. Well, yeah, there's yeah. actually I, I, one of the reasons I had to see these things twice. Like when we did Infinity War, I ended up seeing like the seven o'clock show and like the ten o'clock show because half the group could do the seven and half the group could do the ten. <laughs> and, and Brian, I saw it back. To, it worked out well. It was at the Dome, and Kevin Feige and one of the Russos, I forgot which one, showed up and did the intro on the second show. So I was like, wow, worth it. They love totally doing that. I saw Iron Man too. Favreau and Downey showed up. What? I mean, they, they, yeah, about that place. The arc lights, the place to be, man. But the arc light, the village, the Chinese, they're going to show up at one of those venues in L.A. <gasps> Big, most badass uh, show up I've ever seen. I wasn't even going to the movies. Mm -hmm. I had seen, actually, um, Alamo Bay, uh, an old Ed Harris movie from the 80s. Mm -hmm. And they were showing it how to take like an old movie and show it in 4K projection over at the Linwood Dunn at the yeah. Academy. Well, that's right around the corner from Arclight. So my buddy and I watched that. Then we go into the Arclight just to eat at the cafe. And we hear a bunch of noise, right? It's right. opening weekend of... Da, my story, Nick Frost, Simon Pegg, the Alien movie. Oh, um, uh, World's End. Yes, World's End. Uh, uh, yeah. And they uh, so they're off in the corner talking mm -hmm. with Trey Parker, Quentin Tarantino, and Bill Hader. Yeah, like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I was like, this is. I, I just everybody shut up. I want to hear what they're talking about. <laughs> you know, like talk, and, and they all were going in <laughs> and right. introducing their film at ArcLight. Uh, just that wish day. You'd like yeah. run out to your car, like, get a boom pole. I mean, that was like the that was a pretty yeah. pretty dense you know yeah. group of people I'd like to listen to. Well, it's fun. It's fun. Because that's the best thing about seeing movies in LA is just you never know. Like we saw the uh, the Irishman, uh, Scorsese's new film, opening night at the uh, the Village. Paul Thomas Anderson's in the audience, mm. just hanging out because he wants to see it in a theater, and that's the best theater to right. see it in. And that's yeah. just they're 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 like us. They know the best theaters, and they want to go see these things in the best theaters with the audience. I had a friend of mine. Uh, uh, who's a filmmaker as well, mm -hmm. and I used to get really annoyed when I would go to movies, you know, somebody would be there and... <laughs> God, somebody there was snoring behind me. Somebody's, gonna... like, talking or, you know, whatever it was, and and he said something to me that that uh, that I just loved, and it goes with what you're saying about mm -hmm. seeing movies with audiences. He's like, I said, you know, I can't, sometimes I just can't go. I've, I'd rather just watch it at home, and he said, you know mm -hmm. what? You have to go. You're a filmmaker. You have to go, and you, you have to experience movies with people, and 100%. you have to see what really moves them what really makes them stop talking what mm -hmm. really and from that moment on i just went you know what he's right and i just shut the heck up and i just watch the movies and and now if, if those things are happening i'm just like well they're obviously not engaged yeah <laughs> for the most part yeah. there was one guy i taught 21 bridges yesterday and some guy was snoring behind me i oh. i had to move up three rows i hear yeah. that yeah. movie's just like nonstop crazy action it's pretty. Good. It's like an '80s action movie. Yeah. It's like an old, late '80s, early '90s action movie. It's fun. It's not not going to blow your mind, but it's it's a good ride with great actors like J.K. Simmons. And he's asleep. Yeah. And this <laughs> guy. Yeah. He, I mean, he, this guy was just out. Like so, the uh, somebody went out, got the usher to wake him up, and then he just went back to sleep. I, and it was at the ArcLight Sherman Oaks. I often pull the uh, "I work here" card. Hey, yeah. listen, I work here, guys. I'm going to run out and have you tossed if you don't be quiet. You know, and then mm -hmm. they kind of shut up. They think maybe right. I do. I don't, but they, uh, maybe yeah. I do. <laughs> I'm too self-conscious for that. I just keep thinking I've the whole movie, I just think about doing that. I am a nip it in the bud guy. I mean, it often yeah, works. Yeah. I did that at um, early. Yeah. I've done that. Up. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. So some other things we've learned recently about The Rise of Skywalker. Two-hour, 21-minute running time. Not, not crazy, right? Less than last year. I was yeah, really last last hoping for three hours. I really wanted a three-hour tour. You just tour. want a lot. Well, I, I, here's the thing. You just want as much Star you know, Wars as you can get. I, I have realized that no matter what happens moving forward, I'm mm -hmm. sure, you know, I haven't seen The Mandalorian yet. Part of that's wow. because I, I, I'm, I'm deciding on my cable internet situation. <laughs> and part, <laughs> part of that is because... I actually don't want to see it before I see Rise of Skywalker. I kind of don't want... I know a want, couple people like that. Yeah, I don't want anything to, to kind of get in the way of my excitement of that. I'm mm -hmm. truly, truly just looking forward to it. But um, this has been a long time in the making in our lives. And, and at the end of the day, no matter what happens with Star Wars moving forward... You know, there is not going to be uh, the Skywalker saga. None, none of this will be tied mm -hmm. to w really how we've known it. And this is the end of an era. It is. And and uh, I I actually thought to myself, I said to my wife the other day, I'm like, you know, I'm going with Paul and Justin, you know, and we're hanging out. And I, I might cry. <laughs> I might I might really cry. Yeah. Uh, because it, it it means a lot to us. I mean, we've talked about this a lot on the show, what this has meant for us mm -hmm. in our lives, our career choices. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, and honestly, it, it, weirdly enough, uh, not just because of the show and because of the movies, but mm -hmm. well, maybe partially because of the movies recently, but um, 
Star Wars is kind of around almost every day of my life. I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I find myself really? putting the music. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, don't, I don't know why I would say that. No, I mean, but but it's just like it's always kind of there. I'm like, oh, I'll put the music on or I'll, yeah. you know, somehow it comes up in conversation. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, like, well, you know, Luke. Uh, right. It, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of the glue of a lot of <laughs> friends from, from, yeah. a lot of things. from General yeah. Hospital. No, yeah. no, we know the Luke we're Luke talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I had the same feeling when I saw episode three because um, – uh, yes, my, I did too. Yeah, my yeah. dad had passed away actually, and he. Oh, I, sorry. I, it was, well, it was 2005. It's been a while, but mm-hmm. it's. It, he. I had always gone to see Star Wars films with him. It was kind of one of our bonds. Was mm-hmm. going to do these things, and then I was like, I just. And I got to see an early screening. I was mm-hmm. like two weeks before it came out. And it was a village in Westwood, and I was just was like. I had to sit in the theater for a while. I was just like, yeah. that was the last one. Yeah. Like, and I, I didn't. You didn't know there was going to be a Clone Wars or a Disney no. sale. Like right. that was it, and it yeah. was a very kind of weird hollow bizarre feeling yeah and uh you know these things are very much tied and they they and they do mark events like that mm-hmm. they do mark yeah. they, they now mark the passage of time as we grow older it's interesting yeah, yeah. no it's absolutely well Most, put well put mostly i'm curious to see how they wrap up a trilogy with a movie that has rise in the title <laughs> Anyway, uh, well, there's new characters. Oh, you want me to answer that? Or? Well, I mean, they, they put The Last yeah, Jedi in right in the, the middle, eight. so, I mean. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. They're screwing the whole thing up. Uh, also, there are new character posters. I don't know if you saw those. Mm-hmm. So we've got now D.O., I think. Is that the new? Uh, the droid? Is it D.O. The, or is The it hair dryer? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. It's a new droid. Yeah. Um, and a character named Jana. I don't know. And another glimpse of Zori Zori Bliss, who's the Carrie Russell character. That's, that's, uh, oh, that's who the looks two pretty gun. badass. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. The, the Carrie Russell helmet. The, yeah, it's cool. So Plus I uh, the bounty hunter. We recently went to see uh, this John Cena family film uh, about playing with fire. Yeah, wow, playing you're with fire. the guy. You're admitting that I'm the guy. I, hey. I, I have two kids, and ah, okay. uh, uh, my wife said, "Hey, we should take the kids to see this." And I was expecting zero, and it was a really lovely family film. It was funny. I laughed out loud. It, m- my kids loved it. It was it was a great family movie. But what was really awesome <laughs> was just outside the theater was this huge like cardboard Star Wars Rise of Skywalker yeah. cutout with yeah. all these like images on it. I and actually I'll put some uh, images because I took pictures of course. I'm it, like, yeah, kids, you gotta get in front of this right now. I don't know if it's gonna be here later. You know. <laughs> That John Cena just following the Rock's career path to the left. Pretty much, and he, he's got the kid film mm. now. Now he's going to do the sequel. Maybe he's much better, world, a, he's much better actor than the jungle. much better actor than I. Uh, I gave him credit for. I, he had okay. some real honest moments that I was hey, like, oh, he's gonna world wrestling a, is uh, theater. Hey, I mean, it's live theater. I mean, right? You know, yeah. maybe he'll make an HBO show about a guy who like finds young hockey players and <laughs> ushers them into the business. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, listen, if, if you're going into uh, The Rise of Skywalker not having seen the previous adventures of Ray, Poe, Finn, and the gang, you're going to be confused. So let's catch you up with our patented recap of The Force Awakens, which starts the way the episode entrees into the franchise all do. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away... Years have passed since we last saw our heroes, Luke, Han, and Leia. In that time, a new republic was formed. Bureaucracy infiltrated its ranks once again. Big League. And in the outer rim from the ashes of the Empire rose a new evil. The First Order. (laughs) Oh, and Luke Skywalker has vanished. Big news. Probably should have led with that. Yeah. The, the crawl. Mm. The crawl did. So. so, introducing a new generation of characters, starting with Poe. Skadoosh. <laughs> Different Poe. Oh, Poe Dameron. He serves as our Han Solo archetype. For my dead body. With his quick-witted, smart Alec, devil may care attitude, and like Han, the best pilot in the galaxy. Well. At least in the resistance. The resistance? It's what the rebels used to be, only with fewer resources. Ha. Ah. Well, now General Leia has sent Poe on a mission to defend the Valley of Peace. I'm oh, sorry, wait. <laughs> Dif- different Poe, you said. Uh, this Poe is sent to find a secret map that will lead Leia to her brother Luke, who she believes is the only hope to help bring down the First Order. Poe gets the map, but not before the First Order arrives and destroys the small village on the remote planet of Tatooine. Jakku. Y- you mean Jakku. Right. Tatooine was Star Wars. Can't be the first person to confuse the plots between those two. Fearing that our new enemy will find the map, 
Poe hides the map in his R2 unit. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh. You're my only hope. You, sorry. you did it again. Right, sorry. Mm-hmm. BB Same. unit, BB unit, who rolls away and escapes. <laughs> and now... Replacing the evil Darth Vader in this corner, direct from HBO's Girls, it's a boy! And an angry Darth Vader fanboy at that, Kylo Ren! You fat-blooded idiot! (laughs) He's strong with the Force, angry at the world like most teenagers, and willing to do anything to find Luke Skywalker. Our new Vader, Kylo, captures Poe, our new Han, while new R2-D2 BB-8 escapes into the desert where he meets Rey, our new Luke Skywalker. More on that later. But first, introducing a Stormtrooper, FN-2187. Wait a minute, those are probably called something else now, right? Yes. Yeah. He demonstrates the, that Stormtroopers not only have terrible aim, but hearts too, as he can't just bring himself to kill innocent people. <laughs> of course, he may not have been able to successfully kill anyone anyway with the uh, terrible aim. Meanwhile, Ray, a kind, sensitive, lonely orphan of sorts, it's the hard knock life for us. Meets BB-8, who tells her he is on a classified secret mission. Ray decides to help him. And FN 2187's nice guy streak continues, and he helps Poe escape. Poe gives him a new name, Finn, and says they have to go back to get BB-8 because he has a map to Luke Skywalker. So they engage in a huge. Wait a minute. Sorry, uh, they crash. <laughs> Anyway, Finn wakes up in the desert of Tatooine. Jakku. Yes, and Poe is nowhere to be found. But he meets Rey. He tells her that BB-8 has a map to Luke. They escape the planet on the Millennium Falcon, and our adventure really begins. Adventure. Eh, eh, excitement. Eh, eh, Jedi craves not these things. We wouldn't have much of a movie then, would we? Uh, True that. Mm. Next, we learn that Kylo Ren is the grandson of Darth Vader and that he talks to a being on a hologram named Supreme Leader Snoke. He is possibly a villain more powerful than the Emperor? It's false. No way. Not this time. We created it. Not this time. No. Not this time. It's totally fiction. It's fiction. We made it up. Thank you, Jonathan Frey. That could just go made up. Yeah. No, that's that that step. Yeah. Ray and Finn get caught by a large transport ship, and we are reunited with two of our favorite original heroes, Han Solo and Chewbacca. Chewie, we're home. Ray shares with Han that she has a map to Luke, but it seems that something fell apart in their relationship. Why aren't you popping with Chicago Police Department? Something that really doesn't concern you. <laughs> Ray, Finn, Han, Daphne, Fred, Scooby, and the gang make their way to see Han's friend Maz Kanata, who is to help with their next step in their journey. We learn that Finn really just wants to get away from the First Order, who at that very moment decide to launch an enormous assault with their Death Star. Star Killer Base. Star Killer Base, right. And then they blow up Alderaan. Continue the, with the operation. The, um, you may fire when ready. The Hosniat system. I am not good at this. <laughs> Hosniat. <laughs> then a lot happens. Ray finds Luke's lightsaber and has an epic force vision. Then the First Order comes to get the BB unit. Ray briefly faces off against Kylo Ren where he learns she's seen the map to Luke Skywalker. Finn returns to save Ray only too late but is given Luke's lightsaber to fight with. The Resistance comes to save the day. Han is reunited with Leia and we learn that Kylo Ren is really Ben Solo, Han and Leia's son. It's not true. <laughs> That's impossible. <laughs> The Resistance, with the help of former Stormtrooper Finn, come up with a plan for he and Han to help with the assault on the Death Star killer base. Rey is interrogated by Kylo Ren, who removes his mask. Ooh, he's dreamy, too. (laughs) And learns that Rey, too, is somehow strong in the Force. Rey escapes using her newly grown Force powers. Han, Chewie, and Finn make it to Starkiller base, find Rey, deactivate the shield, and the Resistance attacks. God has smiled upon you this day. The fate of a nation in your hands. (laughs) Han and Kylo face off, and Han loves his son so much that he gives his life. Though you die, la resistance is on. (laughs) Eventually, Rey's force powers come to a head. She takes a lightsaber and kicks Kylo's butt. Chewie picks them up in the Falcon, all head back to the Resistance base, where we learn that our old friend R2-D2 had the other part of the map all along. You always had the power to go back to Kansas. Mm. Leia sends Rey and Chewie to find Luke. They make their way to an island where Luke is. Rey climbs a slew of stairs, making her way to the Master Jedi, offers him his lightsaber, and there, the film settles into one of the most iconic shots in Star Wars history. 
setting up a sight gag in the next movie, but still. <laughs> I pulled a clip from Midnight Run. I'm like, I gotta watch that movie immediately. I'll probably watch that tonight. <laughs> God, that movie's so good. Just those two, the chemistry. I mean, it's yeah. outside of Gibson and Glover. I mean, that's like the best Gibson chemistry. Gibson and Glover. Ahead. Gibson and Glover. Oh, I saw them at a God. tribute to Richard Donner a few uh, oh, uh, years yeah, ago. Oh, yeah, we talked about being there. Yeah. Was at that too. Uh, the, incredible it, on stage. Uh, Insane. Gibson and Glover together just makes you want Lethal Weapon 5. Just uh, right I, I, yeah, I've heard the picture. Did you that. watch any of the television show that they did of that? No. Yeah, why? I, me neither. And it's like, yeah, it's Gibson exactly, and Glover. because it's like, yes, thank you. That's yeah. it. That's the whole conversation. That is, anyway, is, back to our regular <laughs> scheduled show. <laughs> All right, I mean, there's not Wait, much more to say about that. I, is this true? Because I, I forgot to look this up. Three hundred and six million was the budget. Three hundred. That's what I found online. Yeah, wow. if the internet is to be believed, and it wouldn't surprise hmm. me if it's. Uh, if does that it's include there. marketing? And yeah, maybe. I mean, I that feel like is, that's with the marketing number. That seems that like. is Let me tell you something. High. Let me complain to one of these cameras. <laughs> Boxofficemojo.com. Did you see that IMDb uh, yeah, bought them up. and just wrecked well, their IMDb, site? Well, IMDb, they've owned them for years. But they, now they've meddled. Yeah, now they've meddled. Um, and I, I, it, it was an old-fashioned site, but this is it's impossible to find things. Yeah, I, and, they, yeah. they eliminated budget. Yeah. Like, how are you supposed have to use the box office numbers? How do you know it's important? Right. Because yeah. you know what the budget of the movie is, and you can compare. But right. now there's no budget. We don't know. Have right. you heard there, there's a group of people actually working to restore the original site on another address and Great. just keep keep it going in the old format? <laughs> yeah, because the internet. I love it. Because, <laughs> yeah, there's enough people <laughs> upset about something that yeah. something's going to be done. They're going to fix so it. So I just go. hit Google, and I'll hit it again here. You guys talk amongst yourselves. Well, okay, so I want to start with just, man, I... Revisiting this film, even though it's not that old, mm -hmm. but it feels I, I like it's been a while. Oh, yeah, it feels like it's been a minute, and I just love this movie. It's I, got I, a good I, energy. I really do. I love this movie. I will say, as I was writing my version of, of our summary, mm -hmm. um, which I always send to him, and he actually adds most of the funny, um, brilliantly, I might add. Um, I, I was I was going through, and I was like, man. Everybody says, like, you know, beat for beat, this is basically a new hope in terms of storyline right. and stuff like that, and I'm like, yeah. It this, is. this kind of is, but I sort of don't care, and I think J.J. Abrams was absolutely right that yeah. in many ways you had to go back to go forward. Mm -hmm. And I also think that, the, you know, when this all happened, for me anyway, when the transfer of Lucasfilm to Disney happened, I was excited mm -hmm. because I thought to myself, if any company, if any film company should own Lucasfilm, it's Disney. They get this style of creativity, they're going to do something with this that's really, really interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they did. And, mm -hmm. and, and right out of the gate. And I know that a lot of people are upset. Like, you know, George had his original stories and they basically right. said, thank you very much. We're not going to go that way. And, you know, maybe some of that. Triumph and, of the will or whatever, though. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, something with the <laughs> wills and it. all this. Only but, the end of the first one. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah. I think they made the right decision in how they've they've dealt with this. I mean, you know, yeah. where it's gone to now and all this like internet talk and all this stuff. But when we go right. back to how you were feeling in this moment, I, I have to say for me, even though Empire is my favorite of all of the Star Wars films, Agreed. The Force Awakens was actually probably the greatest cinematic experience I've ever had in my life. Wow, that's bold. I had never gone to the movies and seen an audience react the way the audience reacted. Hmm. Um, and I've told the story on the show about taking my daughter, and she was fairly young um, when it came out, but I wanted her to experience this, what was happening in this movie theater. Mm -hmm. People were applauding yeah. when Harrison Ford came on the screen. I, I mean, people, I mean, you know, really laughing out loud at things and getting like very emotionally engaged. And I live in Orange County. It's not like I'm <laughs> up here in LA watching the scrim, like a local movie theater, right. you know, and, and, um, and people are like emotionally engaged. Yeah. And when I went, <clears throat> um, I was supposed to go with my wife and uh, the morning we were going, uh, my daughter woke up and was sick. And my and my wife was like, all right, I'll stay. I'll, yeah. And I'm like, I have got to see Star Wars. I'm sorry you're sick, honey. I have got to see kid. Star Wars. So uh, my, my fantastic wife was nice enough. She's like, just go. And so I actually ended up taking my nephew who had seen it. Mm. And I was like, no spoilers. 
Wow. <laughs> and, how, how old was he? Uh, I, I can't remember how old he was at the time. I guess t- uh, maybe 10. That's, he might have that's, been 10. that's hard for a 10-year-old yeah, to keep I was like, No spoiler, but he was good. He was great. He was fantastic. And um, so anyway, we went, and I... I was so excited about this film, about seeing this film, about, you know, I feel like Disney, by them going back, they they really wanted to reset some stuff. Mm -hmm. I think they really, you know, the fans have gotten so upset about things, but in a lot of ways, Disney really tried to listen to the fans. Yeah. Because, you know, the... Now the prequels are heralded as some sort of brilliant thing, but most oh. Star Wars fans were pretty darn upset about the prequels in general. Wait, who's calling them brilliant? <laughs> uh, there's brilliant aspects to well, them, to be sure. And of there's course, a certain, of course. Uh, not to get go there, there's certain political aspects that are kind of amazing to watch now. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, they were, happened, they were slightly but, amazing be, because of the parallels to Bush. Agreed, But now 100%. the parallels to Trump are just... Uh, right. Right. It's pretty, I mean, they're, I, they're really impressive. I'll have to yeah. look it up. I, when, we were, that. when we were doing a movie night, I, I wrote a description of the Star Wars, uh, those prequels through Palpatine's eyes as like he's the hero. Oh my gosh. And it's just... It was, it was something... Oh man, I wish you would bring that. That would be, uh, you got to send that to us. we got to post that. Actually, That's fantastic. you want to pause That's it? Okay. I can look it up. That, uh, uh, should we? Yes, let's. Yes, you know okay. what? We're going to pause and he's going to read it. Okay. So we have paused and now we're back. And right. here we go. This, <laughs> Sorry, these none, are the, the prequel. Yeah. So uh, like uh, Paul set up, I uh, host these movie nights. And to kick things off, we started with the prequels. We mm-hmm. kind of did a chronological viewing. And because uh, there's different ways you can watch them. And to get people to come over, you know, I kind of post, this is what we're doing this weekend. And this is my description of the prequel trilogy. Come watch this escapist fantasy about a corrupt politician instigating a trade war while withdrawing military support from his home nation to give a secret political ally from a rival government a territorial advantage. His ultimate goal to consolidate power and turn a democracy into a dictatorship. Thankfully, this is only a silly space fantasy for kids. And we don't have to worry about oh. such nonsense happening in the real world my goodness <laughs> yeah. it's kind of I mean seriously accurate. the prequels have a whole new level of brilliance <laughs> yeah <laughs> Wow. This is how democracy dies. With wow. With thunderous. <laughs> That's a good line. <laughs> that actually that, is a great that line. That line gave me chills. That, 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 the yeah. Especially because we were in the Bush era and it was, it was just like, yeah, that's it. Wow. And, but it's amazing to think we were there and where we are. Oh now, my God, I want to go Ch- back and watch the prequels again. Yeah. But now Cheney's president. <laughs> oh my god help us. oh boy um, <laughs> we, <should stop. clears throat> we lost the quarter of your audience that's, <laughs> that's fine. it's all right yeah. um but what i was gonna say with regard to 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 these films is that i think disney did consider the the uproar of the prequels yes. and i think that's why they did what they did well i think there was also there was this question of because I, I would have, I would love, I would still love to see George Lucas's sequel trilogy. I think, I think everybody is on that train. I think, for sure. I think we'd all like to see that. But yeah. as soon as, and this is kind of the, the hardest part about being a Star Wars fan is what you want versus what you get. <laughs> you know, we all, we all have because we all were on the playground playing with our action figures yeah. or doing something and coming up with Star Wars stories, yeah. and we all have an idea of who Luke was. And for those of us who were reading the EU back in the day, mm-hmm. um, which is now the Legends, and it all got wiped away, we had whole stories of Luke and Leah and right, Han right. having kids and their families and Luke's wife, Mara Jade, and those were all really great things. But yeah. as, as soon as the Disney sale happened, they said they were making these films, like, <laughs> that's gone. Yeah. And, I, and I was okay with that. I know yeah. I, have, I definitely have some friends in that uh, arena that are just are, they're still mad about it some people are really uh, the, some people love that whole heir to the empire thing and, it was great i mean uh, which great by character. the way somebody yeah. did like an animated version it's dark empire is that what it is yeah they took um there's an audio dramatization of the dark empire comic book series yeah and they animated the first issue so far i, I, I hope they keep going it's pretty I, cool yeah i started watching it. i just kind of came across it and i was like oh this yeah. is kind of cool it's although a, it really does kind of point out like that it's a book yeah because like the 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 scenes in the dialogue you're like no, it, I, I got I got things to do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's an audio book. So yeah. like, I think that also too because it's an audio book, it wasn't meant to have visuals. Right. So right. they spend time explaining what you're watching. But right. Back to uh, to, to uh, the kind of the development of Force Awakens. It's it's Disney. I think had this choice to make of what is Star Wars. Yeah. Is it the original trilogy? Is it the prequels is it the Clone Wars like my nieces were growing up when the Clone Wars were on Star Wars to them is a Silcatano 
Yeah, that's what Star Wars is, and that was great. It made Clone Wars really fun to watch for me because mm-hmm. I was I was trading emails and texts and talking to them about Christmas and giving them DVDs, and they go binge watch it like on Christmas Eve, and I come back and they had seen the whole season. I don't know, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know why they were awake, then. Um, but it was uh, it was a. Uh, it it, it it was you know Star Wars is generational and it mm-hmm. what it is and it defines changes for generation to generation. So if Disney's going to throw their hat in the ring and say this is now Star Wars for this generation, you have to ask. And I think you brought this up in the Rogue One episode. I'm I, and I think J.J. Abrams talked about it on some of the special features. They sat in a room and wrote on a board. What is Star Wars? What mm-hmm. does this mean? And you kind of have to d- ask that question. We kind of you kind of almost have to deconstruct it to start it over again. And the Force Awakens. Plus or minuses. It doesn't always work, as your open kind of illustrates. But it's a, it 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 sh- it is a deconstruction of what Star Wars is to hit the reset button to give you a ground zero that you can build from. Mm-hmm. And it's probably it's really rough for guys of our generation because yeah, yeah we've seen this. Yeah. And like and if you wa- start watching them chronologically again, it's like another planet killer. Yeah. Like, especially if you're going to. I actually you know. remember when um, when the poster came out and you could see the like Star the, Killer yeah, base the, in it. And I remember actually saying to my wife, I hope that's not. Yeah. I hope that's not because I really don't want another one is. of those. But it was. And, <laughs> it was. And now yeah. it is again. <clears throat> it is. It's again. in the ocean or whatever. The end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't I mean, think they're going to use it this time. It's going to be a whole. No, it's a, it doesn't seem operational. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, I think it it's, shoots I water. Think it's broken down. <laughs> yeah. It's, just like, <laughs> it's a big water gun. I the Emperor's just squat. <laughs> This is the Super Soaker, now available <laughs> at Disneyland. Here's what I found on Wikipedia. According, then their, res, their resources, The Numbers, okay. which is a big uh, website for you know, all things. Uh, all things numbers. numbers. Where data and the movie business meet. And they got it as a $306 million budget with $175 million on top of that, predicting a $509 or a $540 uh, million dollar worldwide opening. Of course, we all mm. know it went on to generate two billion yeah wow so biggest movie ever Mm -hmm. they bought lucasfilm for 4.08 billion yeah and i i believe they made that money back within the first year i don't think so not with that production figure no not just with With, star wars but but they had rebels at that point i mean the merchandising certainly helped i'm sure they made it back within the first two or three with it with it by the time you got to rogue the end of Rogue One, I would yeah. reason that they have, but even I don't think they haven't made their money back on uh, Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland yet. Like these, these are big investments they're making. They're well, long-term investments. I also think that that you know, as these companies have more conglomerates, really more like monopolies, really, mm-hmm. that they all kind of feed each other. And you know, to say that that they haven't made money their money back on Galaxy's Edge. You could argue that specifically that that's probably true, mm-hmm. but it's just a part of that universe. It's totally. a part of that that whole brand. And you, you spread know, the it's, cost it's, it's just yeah, it's yeah. just another way to. I mean, really, it's the the theme park stuff. It's just another way to give somebody an immersive experience. Basically, it's free advertising. Well, and it's, it's or really, yeah. it's pay. You're paying for your own advertising. I was going to say, right? are, yeah. is the theme park advertising for the films, or the film advertising for the theme park? <laughs> yes. At this point, like it, 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 it all kind of, Synergy. or the, yeah. the, the the Disney Plus shows, or they're all feeding each other in that cycle. Yeah. Uh, the, the one thing I think, just uh, for you kind of move on from that oh, point can of Can I Disney's just jump investment? in real sure, quick before it. you go on and, and just say, I love the way you said that Star Wars is generational and, and the oh, way you. you stated that because I think that's the most beautiful description and that ties everything together. So yeah. well done. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, the one thing I had to say about uh, just Disney acquiring Star Wars because we're kind of at that point um, you know, with the development of this is that Disney was trying for five or six years to come up with a good sci-fi franchise. They mm. tried with Tron. They tried with John Carter. They were, they literally start realized that they had to go and buy Marvel and buy Star Wars mm. and bring in the franchises that they couldn't develop, which is one of the reasons I think they're throwing money at these things. Yeah. And it's working. Re- and, hey, it worked. If you can't yeah. beat them, join them. It's kind of a great until, philosophy. Until Solo, you know, it seemed like you could spend whatever you want. People will come, Ray. I and, think, and, they, I, and they certainly yeah. come from Marvel. I, and Star Wars, I, I think Solo would have if they'd just given it six months, if they just let I everything think it was cool too, off. Yeah, I think it, it was, was too, too quick. I, I really think that they they tried to employ the Marvel yes. style of, of releasing movies and all this stuff. And I just, <laughs> I, and we've mentioned it on the show before, right. I just don't think the Star Wars fans were ready for that that no. quick. I, mean, they were, ah, well, I just, I just, I'm still taking this in, guys, you know. And as a fanboy, I, was, I had switched to Marvel. Like, that was three weeks after Infinity War. Mm-hmm. I was... 
I was fully in that. And then to like reverse course and go back to Star Wars. Yeah. Like I was like, no, no, Star Wars is winter, Marvel is summer. I'm just give me right. space. <laughs> like I can only help my fanboy brains, my switches. And you're already switching, yeah, Star yeah. Wars to winter. That was hard enough. That was hard. <laughs> right? And but that became such a so many families love seeing that at Christmas. Like you would go like I went home and watched uh, Force Awakens with my nieces, yeah. and that was like a big deal. We could yeah. go see Star Wars together because they're not going to be here in the summer. Yeah, and that was a lot of fun. And that you know, it, it, and again, kind of what your experience with your nephew, you know, it it, it allowed not to hit my greatest hits, but it's like it allowed the generations <laughs> to connect. No, but it's it's absolutely true. When I saw the Last Jedi, I had a a, a similar sort of family experience. I went with my mm-hmm. wife and my daughter and uh, my nephew again, and then uh, my niece, and, and it was like, I mean, it was really a family, I had never had a Star Wars experience yeah. like that, where you're with family, like all these, you know, and no. and it was just like this incredible, maybe that's part of why I, I really enjoyed The Last Jedi, because mm-hmm. I was also sort of able to see it through kids' eyes, you yeah. know, which was fun. And that's one of the reasons I do the movie night groups that I do, is I movies are supposed to be shared with an audience, and it's mm-hmm. better, if, it's even funner if you can take kind of the your friends, the, 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 your group of friends that you would, you would have had in the, in the schoolyard and the playground and watch all the movies with them and then go and keep that conversation going. Yeah. And that discussion and that kind of that community that comes with that, I think really is what makes Star Wars and Marvel great. Yep. Is you get to go there and have that shared experience mm-hmm. and experience that, experiencing that on opening night when nobody quite knows what they've seen. Right. And it's funny, like even when I did that Infinity War back to back, I could tell people had stayed. From the seven o'clock, there there was just a, a incremental less anticipation in the audience, oh, but you could feel it because that there's that palpable just electric energy for that first show. Yeah. Yeah, Everybody that, wants Infinity there. War might have been one of my favorite film going experiences. You talk yeah. about uh, oh, uh, one of my, it's one of mine. But man, when when Black Panther disintegrates, I mean there were yeah. visi- there were audible gasps throughout like, whoa, no! Like people yeah. like couldn't handle wow. that these characters no. were disappearing. I didn't my, see it in the theater. So my, oh God, my godson who was in Minneapolis, I started texting with my uh my buddy I've known since kindergarten. Um he he was uh, a little young at the time and uh he, he was crying for three hours. He was like, and my buddy was just like, uh, uh-huh. Marvel, get rid of the, you know, I can't believe they did this. I can't believe they get rid of everybody. But I, mean, I just, I've been consoling him for hours. And I was like, and part of me, I just texted him back. It's like, I'm really sorry. It's kind of awesome that it had that impact. Mm-hmm. Okay, but and let, let and, me, and that there was that kind of anticipation that Star, the original Star Wars had. Like, I remember I was five when Empire came out and I spent three years going to wishing fountains at the mall, putting in pennies, going, I hope Han Solo's okay. We talked about it on the show. Wow. I didn't get it. Yeah. My parents had to explain. No, he's not dead. I'm like, ah. And I watched yeah. Empire, and clearly it's all set up that he's going to be frozen. <laughs> totally. <laughs> this is meant for Luke, and he's, we're just taking right. I mean, I'm, I'm at 10. I'm like, no. Nah. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, as adults, we kind of have to take that. I, I always ask, how do the kids like it? My friend's kids. How did they, how did they feel about it? Because yeah. we know. We know the signs. We know the cliches. We know what they're setting up. We know the business model. We know too damn much. Yeah, I and, totally agree with that, and it bums me out yeah, sometimes. But see, the worst movie I've ever seen is Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, <laughs> coming on the heels of my favorite movie of all time, which is Raiders of a Lost Ark, which is probably part of the reason Crystal Skull was such a letdown. Yeah. And a friend of mine said he took his kid, and the kid just sat there wide-eyed like, wow, what up. an amazing adventure. And I'm sitting there going, this is the worst, laziest, you yeah. know, this, but you can't... Uh, yeah, you have yeah, to. It's generational. That's it's, what I meant to yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. We're comparing Star Wars with the Marvel Universe, and there seems to be some major love for the <laughs> Marvel Universe, as there should be. And there's, of course, yeah. love here for Star Wars. It's uh, but it's something. But it's something that we've talked about before, and that is, you know. Marvel had something that Star Wars didn't, and that is that they they really were setting this up. They've been setting this up for a very long time, yeah. and, and and there then there was a plan in mm-hmm. place. You know whether or not they knew it was all going to work, and they were really going to be able to make all of these movies. I mean, you know who who really knows? But the, I do believe that they they spent the time to make those stories and to see that yeah. through. And I I don't think that Star Wars had that same thing. I you know there's there's so much. I mean there's literally. Uh, interviews where George Lucas says, no, there's never going to be an episode right. seven. There's other ones where he's like, I'm definitely going to make an episode seven. <laughs> you know, well, I, I, just, I, you know yeah. I mean, you know, so there's a lot of... Uh, I think I it's know. also in the DNA of the concept. I think the thing about Marvel was because you're pulling from all these different come up with properties and they all have their own genre mm-hmm. inherent into the issues that then can be translated into the film. Star Wars is Star Wars. That's right. That's the genre. Yeah. And so I... And I... Th- we're, we're getting there. I think... Uh, 
the Mandalorian is a good step in the right direction where we're start and you can look at some of the animated shows mm -hmm. um, like Resistance is is it's a, a kids adventure show mm -hmm. um, versus like the Clone Wars which is like a war drama um, you're, mm -hmm. you're starting to see them find and carve out ways to make genre in Star Wars like how do you make us because that's a great thing about Marvel like you have Winter Soldier well that's a political thriller you have Ant Man that's a heist film Star Wars doesn't have that mm -hmm. yet. Right, um, and they haven't found the way to do that. They they're just asking. Well, they're would still deconstructing what is Star Wars. Solo is it was sort of their in some ways their first foray into yeah. that, and I think because I think Solo is is really a a, a Western. It is. I mean, <laughs> well, I think that that's the interesting thing though is eventually. It's, Star Wars is just a bunch of different variations on westerns and samurai films. The Mandalorian is a western, whereas right. Solo is a old school, you know, fifties western, yes. like sh the more, you know, more in the Shane variety kind yeah. of thing. Mandalorian is deconstructionist, Sergei Leone, you know, post Kurosawa kind of western film. Right, right. I just threw a lot of film crap. Yeah, out yeah. no, but but, you know, awesome. but your obser <laughs> your observations are so so brilliant, so well spoken. Thank so you. well, we let's jump into a little bit more about the Force Awakens. I mean, well, first of all, I, I, I appreciate Abrams wanting to get Lawrence Kasdan on board, but he 100%. wasn't bringing Empire. And Raiders of the Lost Ark cast on board. <laughs> he brought aboard Dreamcatcher. It Lord's wasn't a, cast. There was no poop monster. It and wasn't that, that bad. It, I mean, there's not a poop monster terrorizing. <laughs> yeah. The first order, Snoke is not a big poop hologram. That would be Dreamcatcher. Yeah, that would be bad. That would oh be Dreamcatcher. So I never felt there was quite a cast. Kazdanian stamp on it, mm. like some of his uh, early, like Silverado or some of the, the great uh, action films yeah. he made years ago. Well, there ago. was the original was more of an script. Abrams th thumbprint on the script. I hundred percent. Yeah. The, I, the, yeah. the original script was by oh, I forgot his name. Michael, Michael Arndt. Arndt. Yeah, Arndt. And I would love to see what he did because first of all, hey, he, I don't think he, he finished he, it. He, won, he didn't because yeah. they didn't give him enough time. No, they did. He needs the more film. time. Yeah. They actually yeah. in the behind the scenes. I was just watching the behind the scenes for this, and yeah. and uh, Kathleen Kennedy talks about that. That she's like, yeah, he normally likes to have like two or three years just to kind of marinate. You know. Marinated yeah. in it and and, and then and win an Oscar. Yeah, I mean, and then yeah. she was time. like, "Well, we just really we didn't just have time." Four billion yeah. dollars, we don't have time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Sorry about <laughs> that. Yeah, I mean, it would have been great to see it for sure. But I, I, I also think the writing process for this was very interesting. I mean, if you've ever mm -hmm. seen the behind the scenes, oh, yeah. I mean, they they literally kind of wrote this like on the road. I mean, they're like flying all mm -hmm. over the place and like taking walks and recording conversations. Which, and I mean, it's recording very, re do, writing a Star Wars movie in motion is kind of the best idea ever. In some <laughs> ways, it's so like you too, kind of yeah. should be going around doing things, right? and flying and walking and running and things. Yeah, I kind of I want you know I can just see them like they're recording notes into their phone and then having somebody transcribe it because yeah. you're on the go. I, I think some of that's really cool. I think Abrams' choice to bring Kazan in was kind of a reaction to Lucas leaving, too. It's like, you kind of got to have one of the Godfathers. Yeah, yeah. You got to have some... Okay, if we can't have the guy who, you know, you can't have the creator, we're going to at least have... The, 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 the next guy in the yeah. chorus who's going to come in here and like everybody loves and respects and it, it's a stamp of approval. Why do you think, I mean, this is all hearsay, but just conversation piece. I mean, mm. why do you think that Kasdan wasn't, what, do you think he was asked to, to, he didn't want to, to do all three of these movies? No, he didn't want to. He didn't want to. He was the only reason he was there. He was, cause they had started Lucas to sell the company to Disney and Kasdan has said this. They had to have a certain number of Star Wars films in development. The only reason Lucas started developing uh, 7, 8, and 9 was to show a potential buyer that there was value in the company of expanding the franchise. And oh, wow. so they had, he had wanted... And That's so like he, selling a house and being like, well, we got to put it in a new kitchen. It was. <laughs> he, was redoing the, he was redoing the floors and making sure there were new <laughs> toilets in there. And oh it was God. a power-saving fridge. We'll call it Lawrence Kitchen. Yeah. Oh and and uh, he brought on Kazd. Kazdan wasn't interested in more of, of that because I think he, if you, if you read the making of Return of the Jedi, there's some great uh, transcripts from story meetings of George and uh, Kasdan like fighting over what the force is. And Kasdan just finally going, well, I don't agree with you, but it's your movie. And just writing what George wants. Wow. And kind of like, you know, because that was their third film together. I think he'd been through this and he was just like, well, he helped me get body heat done. So I got to kind of do a favor and close out the trilogy. But I really want to move on and do Silverado. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, here he, he Solo was his corner that he was interested in. Yeah. Solo was where he wanted to focus his attention. And then kind of they got in trouble. And I think what Kasdan, and you can really see it. You mean the it, movie Solo? Yeah, the movie okay, Solo. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, Solo was, he wanted to do Han's origin story. Okay. He wanted to do, that was going to be his little area oh. to kind of work and develop. And 
it was it was away from the force, so it was away from George's ideology. Mm -hmm. He could kind of do mm, what he true. wanted to do. Yeah. And I think, and when you look at Force Awakens, the, this Kasdan stamp is that he's kicked Princess Leia and Luke to the side. It's Han's mm. movie. And if you look at Han and the first scene in Solo, or second scene, where he's running through there trying to find Kira, I, we just watched this, um, and, he, and you can hear somebody going, oh, uh, Proxima will give you so many portions for that. Han grew up in Ray's environment. He grew up mm. fighting for whatever, his overlord's approval to get portions of food. Right. And I think Kazan's thing was building that relationship of, of Han to Ray and connecting them. And I think that's where his interest, and that was his hook to to be interested enough to, to do The Force Awakens. Uh, speaking of Han and Rey, mm -hmm. so I'm reading uh, The Last Jedi, the novelization. Ooh, I haven't um, gone there yet. Yeah, I, 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 I've never really done that with any of the movies. I've okay. tried with the original trilogy, and it was just kind of laborious. Oh, and I, the, I Jedi kinda, one, the Jedi one was huge because that was the first time you heard Vader in lava. I oh. remember just being on the playground pouring over those two pages. Okay, I need friends. to give those another uh, try. Well, it, it, it's different now because we've seen the visuals. In right, 83, right. I was eight years old. We hadn't right. seen it. You hadn't seen just, it, yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. But so I'm reading this, this The Last Jedi novelization, and something jumped out at me that was like, w wait, what? And there's a moment, uh, it's the moment where um, Rey accidentally, sh well, she shoots her, her gun because right. she sees Kylo Ren in her, you know, whatever yeah, she blows a hole room, and she blows a hole in the thing, and, and, you know, Luke says, what's that, and all that stuff, and then the, the, the caretakers kind of react like, oh, she's messing up this thing, and, right. and in the novelization, Luke says something like, don't worry to them, and then, and then he says, it's my niece, mm. and I was like, your niece? <laughs> Wait, did you just put that Ray is your niece in the novelization? Is that the connection? <laughs> I don't think that's a connection. Or I don't think it is either, but I just thought that was a very interesting. I, th I, th I think her, if you, you want to be too much family, if we go that route. Yeah, I, well, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I, I think her, I think he was just, you know, in the novelizations, yeah. just, you know, he's just. Well, listen, to, the novelization yeah. of Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull says that the monkeys fight communists because they have the same hair as. Shia LaBeouf's character, and they figure they should follow him into battle. I don't believe these novelists. Wait, I mean, that's did you probably read, is the, that true? <laughs> oh yeah, really? Yeah, the monk. Well, you know, you there know, was a scene in the ever, novelization from the monkeys' point of view. I can't believe you read. You read the, the novelization there's, of a there's movie a bit you in there hated about so much. The monkeys <laughs> saw his hair, and it's the same pompadour the they read. have. It's a hate so then, I mean, like, <laughs> I am gonna read this <laughs> thing. Exactly, like, I, have to, I have to just <laughs> experience how horrible this is. <laughs> They had the same pompadour. There's actually so a Kingdom of the Crystal Skull poster <laughs> hidden behind this. I have um, one, yeah. Oh, <laughs> my God. It doesn't come out oh much. My God. I have one. That's brilliant. It's okay. But I think it, I have the... But, yeah, yeah. It, 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 they have a pompadour. Well, let's do what he says. Attack communists. Let's go do wow. it. I mean, yeah. they, they okay. justify things in these books that All they right. probably wanted the film to show. And so right. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, yeah. they, if that's... I'm still surprised that's Pablo Hidalgo let that get through. Yeah, yeah, I was too. I, well, yeah. actually, it's funny you mentioned him. I have him on our list of people to talk about just because it, uh, I just think it's interesting that he's the, the, the expert. Me. Who is this? Go ahead. I know you know more than. Yeah, well, I mean, myself. there's a one of the. I think Disney was kind of trying to emulate the Marvel model where the original Marvel, there was the story group at Marvel, which is like Bendis and a couple other people, Brian Michael Bendis. And. Um, and they would kind of advise on the on the Marvel films up through Civil War when the big internal Civil War happened and the story group was disbanded and Feige got control of Marvel Studios and I got control of everything else until about two months ago. Um, mm. uh, that's a whole other podcast. Wow. Um, but <laughs> Lots going on. What I would love to have, by the way. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, give me a call. You got my number. <laughs> um, but uh, the um, for, uh, for Star Wars, they formed a, an internal Lucas story group. And the interesting thing was in um, around the year 2000, Lucas wa uh, wanted to categorize and catalog everything that existed in the Star Wars database. And part of it, at the time, it was kind of seen as, well, we have all these books, we have the novels, we want the video games, we want them to all connect. We want it to be one single expanded universe. Mm -hmm. And so that way we can give an author a database. Here's the research on the ships and everything. What's interesting was that database was then what was used to sell Bob Iger partially on Star Wars. Because hmm. they gave him this database and say, well, it's just like Marvel. Here's a database of, you know, 20,000 characters and all these vehicles and all these stories and all these books and all these comics you get. So you have all that material to develop. And so that was this guy, uh, Leland Chi, 
who was the keeper of the holocron, as they call it. And he was kind of uh, another guy that came up was Pablo Hidalgo. And they formed the core, I think, and they, with other people, too, of the Star Wars story group. And they were, they're there to kind of oversee all the projects that Star Wars wow. does and make sure everything connects and the dots kind of link up. And uh, This is going to be a six-hour podcast. I am so <laughs> fascinated right now. <laughs> good Keep luck. Going, just good keep, luck editing keep, yeah. this. <laughs> As an editor, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, my God. I mean, that's just that, it's no amazing. I, yeah, that's yeah. just incredible. Um, so wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they, they, these. I mean, you'll see them. If you watch the credits of any Star Wars thing, you'll see the Star yeah, Wars story yeah. credited. Um, and it's changed because certain producers have left, like Kiri Hart. They've moved on. They got hired by Ryan Johnson, actually, for his company, um, which is another interesting thing about the turnover at Lucasfilm. But that's also a different podcast. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> wow. Well, let, let's jump over since you mentioned the editors. Let's talk about oh, the editors. Yes. Because we yeah. talk, were talking about this before, uh, Sean and I, before we started recording. It's amazing that the movies we love most, mm -hmm. I, I don't mm -hmm. know who made them. Yeah. Sometimes. I don't right. we we sat here talking about Star Wars going, who shot Star Wars? But yeah. Who, yeah, it, we, it took yeah. us a long Nobody time. Nobody George Lucas liked. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> he hated Gilbert. <laughs> yeah, Gilbert Taylor. And yeah. but, but we didn't know. We had to look it up. I'm like, how do we not know that? Yeah, because I, it seems like I, in in other films, like I, I I my example was who shot the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford, Robert Elswit. Why do I know that? I don't know, but I should know who shot Raiders of a Lost Ark for the love of God, Douglas Slocum. But yes. still, I, uh, say. <laughs> I didn't know who ed I didn't know who edited uh, the, the Force Awakens, and it turns out it's pretty much JJ's team. It's JJ's team. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. JJ's yeah. team. It's Bad the, robot people, it's Star the, Trek people, it's Super the two, Eight, Cloverfield people. I think the two women who started with him. I'm yeah, blanking on their names, and I feel I bad. Got Marianne they, Brandon and yep. Mary Jo Markey. Now, and Marianne, they're very talented. Continues they on. They are very to talented. Rise of Skywalker. Okay. Uh, Mary Jo seems to be replaced by Stefan Grube. Interesting. Oh wow! Those? I wonder how that happened. Okay. Um, I, I I think the editing in Force Awakens is just fantastic. I mean, just you know, revisiting it again for this podcast and just watching. Yeah. I mean, they they capture moments. They capture and and I was reading some articles about them and and they're just they're just such smart, creative women. They just mm -hmm. really thought about everything. And they had this whole conversation about how you know when when you're approaching these like fight scenes and like mm -hmm. you know does there need to be dialogue and how much that you know right. how much of the dialogue and like it in there like it no at a certain point like the dialogue is the fight like right. the the way you do and and they just talk about it in such a, it's like a dance i mean I, I just think they're fantastic well, i think it's also really a big credit to jj abrams and how he set up bad robot because it really is in a weird way, it's kind of what I think George Lucas wanted Skywalker Ranch to be. Mm. Because th from what I understand, they, um, they're they cutting the films you know, as you're, you're shooting. Mm -hmm. You're just doing assemblies. And then you get into the edit bay, and they have a, the day team is editing. The night team comes in and conforms so they can come back and watch the previous day's work in 5.1 <laughs> and, and just keep editing. And so you. Oh my God! And that's then they, just crazy. I mean, can you know yeah. compared to what we used to do for dailies? Oh yeah. I mean, you know? I, 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 I'm you know I'm a USC film school guy. I learned how to cut on 16 tape, yes. splice, chopping block, the whole thing. But the, the and then they schedule three at least three scoring sessions, I believe. So you have a major block, like you know the movie comes out in December. You do a major block in March. So wow. Williams comes in. He does his themes. He does it to the rough cut, and then. Versus what George used to do, and like the ending of the music in the ending of episode one is atrociously cut because George recut the ending after the mu music was recorded, oh. and so it's not cut the way William scored it. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and you can kind of once you know that you can feel it. Yeah. Um, but it, for for this one, um, Jay wants to avoid that, so he'll they do one, then they cut the movie with the score as they have it and feel it out, and then they. Let Williams come in, do another maybe record another twenty minutes or so of music, adjust it. Then the the third one, I think he did his last one. I was just reading an interview in Vanity Fair, and he uh, was Abram said he had just was listening or had just come from the scoring stage at Sony. Um, it's a great yeah. piece of music. I mean, this is one of Williams's I, best I, Star Wars scores. I the think it's one of his best is, themes ever. Yeah, this I rem that was the one thing I was really impressed with Force Awakens was what John Williams like John Williams just came with his yeah. A game yeah like it was just it was like I got more hits well Here yeah we and he just like wrote so much I mean there's so much new stuff in there it in is. fact I actually the music threw me off mm -hmm. the first time I saw Force Awakens I was so moved by the film like I was right. shaking I was like so excited You're about the it. film and the but I did remember saying to my wife well the one thing was the music 
I don't know. And then, no. of course, later on, once I got the soundtrack, as I always do with Star Wars yeah. movies, I fell in love with it because then I'm replaying it in my head and all of mm-hmm. that stuff like we always do. And <laughs> um, it, and it was so great, but it kind of it was because I was I went in sort of expecting themes that I knew and I didn't get that yep. and it was but this theme right out of the gate was yeah. just absolutely gorgeous. Well I think it's one of the things about Star Wars films in particular for me is I realized that there is a process for me and mm. I, I this extends to Marvel or any franchise that I love where because um, I have the movie in my head mm-hmm. so I watch the movie and I fight the movie Mm. I'm I'm at oh, that's war with the movie usually. I, I I'm better at this than I used to be. But I'm at like Star Trek movies. I was like, because mm. it's just like <laughs> that's not what they would do. Like the first JJ ones, I was like, Arr. oh but, god, uh, I loved that movie. I, and, and there's oh, parts of it I it, really yeah. love, and I was really anti Giacchino score for that. Uh, mm. The first time I heard it, I was like, I know. Oh, good good lord, no, no, no. Score. Now it's I love it, and I wrote, score. I wrote a whole a script. <laughs> Since then, to listening to that score, it's a great score. But my Star Trek. My ingrained inner Nicholas Meyer, Star Trek II, James Horner, <laughs> you know, fanboy. Yeah, freaking Yeah, come on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, there's the, there's the, I think that's true with all these things. There's the movie we want, like I said that earlier, there's the movie we want, there's the movie we get, and there's a mm. process of acceptance of, I have to go a couple times and get what, not what I want, but what the filmmakers wanted. Mm-hmm. What were they trying to achieve? Versus what I thought they should try to achieve. Yeah, and I think that that's the hardest thing I think for all fanboys to kind of do, or fangirls, or whoever, yeah. is just distance yourself from your expectation, mm-hmm. um, because it's so hyped and so built up, and so mi- so much time spent thinking about this, and so many theories. Um, I respect and, that, and I think I've changed in my older uh, yeah. viewer years hmm. to say that a movie impressed me. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily always grab me. Like a sure. movie that grabs me, I, I mean, we yeah. know right away, like Infinity War or Captain Phillips or any no. number of genres and types of movies. Totally. But then I can look at a movie that was super impressive. For some reason, I'm not emotionally involved, but I know what they were going for and I know right. they yeah. did it well. well the, and I can't say that I didn't like it just because I wasn't. No, the, and there, there's always the scale. Yeah. And it's like, you know, like, you and I just saw Knives Out, and Knives Out is like, it grabs you. It's great. Oh my it's God. amazing. I it's I don't really good. No spoilers. Good. No, no spoilers. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's worth the ride. Oh, it's a I'm so excited. It. There's no I'm... way you give a spoiler ever. No, no. Fun. Stop watching trailers. Just go see the movie. Yeah. Um, but it's a, you know, it's great when you have those kinds of, because you, like, you're like, you guys are like me. I see, a, you see a lot of movies, and not every movie has that transitory experience. Yes. You go to Star Wars, you go to Marvel. And you want it like a drug because that was your first hit. Yeah. You know, like I had my first you're hit back, when I was back three years old. Back to the dealer, man. Yeah, man. It better be the same it was stuff like, you serve up, It doesn't up, feel man. the same, same man. man. And it's, guess what? It's not going to. Um, <laughs> I mean, we, we were just so damn lucky that Empire was a better hit. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Um, but it... it you know, I, I, so I think that's that expectation. So the fact that you can go in and have the experience, like you said, you had with Force Awakens. Yeah. Where, and I had the same thing. I went multiple times just because I was enjoying watching Star Wars with an enthusiastic audience. Yes. It's incredible. Right. Um, I, I, same thing with Infinity War. I just enjoyed watching an audience who hadn't seen it react <laughs> yeah, to I'd, it. I would like to be more like my friend Adam, who's also part of the movie, guys. Uh, I brought him to see Infinity War, I believe, mm-hmm. that one day at your place. And oh, yeah. uh, we were... You know, he's just psyched that there's a Punisher war zone movie. I'm like, but this is an awful movie, right? It's yeah, but how great movie. is it that there's a Punisher movie? <laughs> I'm like, all right. And he's all excited. It's the greatest thing you know, ever There's saw. also a Punisher short called Dirty Laundry. I'm not really excited about it. <laughs> but he is. Why? Because there Cause is it, one. Because it's a sequel to <laughs> Thomas Jane. Yeah. Okay. And I'm trying to get there. I'm I, trying to get there. I love I I'm not quite there either with you. <laughs> I, I love when people celebrate other people's pop culture. I have a friend of mine who yeah. wrote something on Facebook one time about. You know, I I'm excited that you're you're excited about Agreed. Game of Thrones or whatever. <laughs> I don't enjoy that necessarily, but but don't basically don't dog me for my pop culture. Well, that listen, I you're, like, now you're you know? being now you're just calling out the internet, which you should because <laughs> honestly, I mean, I, 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 I you know when people I say hey, I love this movie, and then someone craps like, thanks for coming all the way over here and taking a crap on the thing I like. Did you think mm-hmm. about why you did that? Let's yeah. go away. And I yeah, need it. well, that's I, right. no time anymore. Yeah, I think that's actually the best thing about. I know. You know, we're going through a phase where people are kind of dumping on the way cinematic experiences are, are delivered. Yeah. And I use that terminology very carefully because we live in a streaming era where we're getting movies into our home. Yeah. Um, but the great thing is, is that you now can hit your audience. Yeah. In a way you never could before. You can get, I, like, I love Star Trek. I'll gladly pay 
for CBS All Access when they're showing Star Trek. If they're not showing Star Trek, I'm not paying. Um, I, got, I, got, I have a <laughs> gift card for a free month. I'm holding out for Picard. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> or come on over and watch it over at my place. Yeah. Um, we're going to have Star Trek nights. Uh, but it's like, it, you know, it, you can get that money directly from the uh, from the consumer now. You, I, I, I'll pay for Star Trek episodes. I'll pay, I'll pay Disney. I paid for three years of Disney Plus in advance. I am pr- I am done. I, I don't have to worry about that because yeah. they're going to have all the toys I want. And I'm gladly going to give them my money for that. And that's kind of amazing. We're going to get yeah. high quality stuff that we want to that we actually want to see that we can actually geek out about. And I, I kind of love that. I mean, I'm you know, I'm I know people I've worked with who would pay top dollar for a Hello Kitty streaming service. I have no interest in that. But they're going to do it. Are you going to go on their Facebook wall and go stupid no, like that? No, dumb, no, no. Kids. I'm happy they're it's happy for kids, and, and I'm yeah. happy they have what they want. Let alone, yeah. I think that's you know I, I, that, that's kind of what we live live in. We, it's, it's a very democratic way of making entertainment now. Yeah, it's lovely. Did you have a? Did you guys have a favorite? Nostalgic moment watching Force Awakens, something that. Oh, is that like, what we're talking about? Yeah, I Force know, Awakens. I know, right? We're, <laughs> I figured, I, I figured I'd try and get it. This isn't the answer you want, but I'm, st- I'm still pissing. Nobody cares as much as I do that Han Solo died. Hmm. You know, and between I, that and Fast and Furious, no one cares that did Hans you like, died. Did you like? <laughs> did you like the way he he died in terms of just from a storytelling point of view? Did that? Did you feel like that was satisfying? You know, I I, I wasn't. I mean, I, this is what to your point, Brian. As mm. I. Came in, to, wanted to see Han Solo be Han right. Solo, and he wasn't. He was broken and beaten down, and that's not what I wanted yeah. to see. So then I brought myself around to seeing the movie they wanted to give me, yeah. and I like it. I don't love it, though. I don't have a Han Solo in the first three movies love for The that Force Awakens. So I kind of just watch it and go, well, that happened to him, and I wish it was uh, something else. But what, yeah. what can I do? I think you and I talked about this once. Was I think the hardest thing about... The, the two films we have so far, we haven't seen the third one yet, but it's, is that um, we didn't get the Han, Luke, and Leo we wanted to see. We yeah. got the real versions. Yeah. And that if Star Wars kind of always exists in as a 60s, 70s parallel, they, if, they, if, they, if you know, Endor is their Vietnam, and uh, Luke is the spiritual hippie, Han is Easy Rider, mm. and Leo is like the, you know, the political protester. Mm-hmm. This is exactly where they would end up in the real world. Mm-hmm. Luke got pissed off and went back to the commune. Han died riding his motorcycle. And uh, Leah is still inside the system trying to make things work. Hmm. It's not the most interesting thing, per se. <laughs> oh, my God, your well, insights are so great. Why don't you just stream yourself 24 <laughs> hours? I mean, seriously, you have so much to say. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd go watch, you know, a, a, a Vietnam movie if I wanted that. I mean, well, yeah, I, yeah. Um, I, I, but you know what? To your but, point, that was the thing that I loved <laughs> about the movie. I, 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 but you know, the thing that made so many people mad was the thing that right. I loved because it was like, yes, this, this is what happened. You know, you know, you set out on this journey. You know, you're young and you're fresh faced, mm-hmm. and oh, everything, I'm gonna go take over the world, and then right. things happen and life happens, and you face stuff, and it, it doesn't always work out the way you think it's going to, and right. and and you're left with your bad choices sometimes, and you have to make the best. I, I don't know. Yeah. I thought well, that was. It, well, I, I think, talking it out loud though. If if we did the whole story in reverse. We'd be disappointed where Ben Kenobi ended up. Yeah. Instead, we get to see him all b- broken down and uh, you know in hiding, mm-hmm. and then we see him awesome. Yeah. It's kind of a yeah. reverse. Well, I think it's also something I think interesting as you get older, looking at Luke and seeing somebody who he he was the hero. Mm-hmm. He completed his hero's journey. Yes, that's he right. He did everything right. Yes, I totally agree. And then he made a mistake. Wow. That's kind of you don't see that. I, I think t- that's really I, see, interesting. I think it was a bold choice. I oh, think I, I won't argue anything about the original trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think it's hard to look at because it's almost it, it's almost too much weight to put on Luke because he means so much to re- the rest of us that it's a, like it would almost be more interesting if you did that to a different character in a different universe. Yeah. Um, can I just I, I think say, it's hard to accept for us? But yeah. Sorry. Uh, can I just say? Opening scroll. Mm-hmm. So excited to see this film. Uh, you know, we've only Are seen. Are we on Last Jedi or Force Awakens? For, Force Awakens. Okay. <laughs> Opening scroll. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like ready. I'm like, you know, th- a long time ago, galaxy far, far away. And the first thing that comes up, mm-hmm. Luke Skywalker has vanished. Yeah. 
my jaw was on the floor. I mean, I was like shaking. So many questions. I, I mean, I, yes. I mean, right out of the gate, you're just like, what, what? What do you mean? And then, and and I was listening to the soundtrack on the way here tonight, and Me too. and. I, I'm listening to it going, my God, they just threw us into this action. Mm-hmm. They they give us this, like, Luke's gone. This guy's going to get this thing, and here you go. Yeah. And, and we're just going. And, and you know, uh, for for the people that were able to to – to kind of go, okay, we're gonna let go of of Han, Luke, and Leia, and we're we're following these new characters right now. Yeah. I think it was a fun ride. I think for the people that were like, I want to see Han, Luke, and Leia again, I understand mm, they I, were pissed I, about that. I'm so. not lying. In that battle at the end, when that lightsaber pulls out of the ground and flies oh, across, God. I was waiting for it to land in Luke's hand. Yeah, yeah. And Ray grabs it. I'm like, I guess that's interesting. So, <laughs> no, I, but I, I was I, like, I, if Luke came back, it's one of I the mean, greatest on. cinematic moments. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I agree with you. I actually, I li- I love that it went in Ray's hand. I, I, that, yeah. It actually worked for me. I agree. It would have been amazing I, if it landed. See, to me, I, had, I totally see this metaphorical, beautiful moment. It goes yeah, all the I, way across, right into her hand, yeah, yeah. and it's like the torch has been passed to a new generation. I get that, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's okay. The rest of the, explain that? The I'm rest of the internet that, agrees with you. I'm so it's impressed okay. by that, but <laughs> yeah. I'm not. Yeah, I'm impressed by that, but I'm not galvanized by that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, actually, I, 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 and credit back to John Williams. He's doing so much heavy lifting in that moment to make us oh, feel what we're yes, feeling. Yes, yes. Um, it, it so much relies on his force themes to make that moment work. Um, and it, it wouldn't land in the way that it does without that. And I, I, I do yep. think it, it it's leaning heavily on John to to make us feel that as if we're, we're willing to accept it. Um, and I accept the manipulation, but I yep. do agree that it is a manipulation, even though I found it to be an effective one. Absolutely. Oh, and can we just talk about that scene in particular, which one, I love the fact that they built the forest mm-hmm. in the soundstage. It looks amazing. Yeah. But two, you know, this was the first Star Wars movie that had... The tubes. The lightsabers yeah. that could actually light up, which Lucas, I think, always had wanted. Well, he kind of did it in and two. He tried to, he tried yeah, to, he tried it to do really it. Work. But the fact that that light actually, in a practical Interacts. way, hits the actors' faces. I yeah. mean, we saw the blue and the red and the, you know, the light and the dark, mm-hmm. all that stuff. I mean, you know, J.J. Abrams uses light a lot in, in yeah. terms of storytelling. I, I think in a very lovely way. Maybe sometimes over overdone. It's a little too But, but, but I, I really like it. But I just thought that in particular mm-hmm. was was a great, like, hey, let's let's upgrade this. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? No, and it's a great moment in a great setting. And I think one of the things that most people criticize The Force Awakens for is seeing something you haven't seen before. And seeing a lightsaber battle in that setting mm-hmm. at that time of day or night mm-hmm. uh, was something we hadn't seen before. That's and right. That, and that was really cool. I think yeah. that was a really uh, excellent choice on his part. Yeah. What do you guys, what did you feel about Rey and her force powers? Did the did it bother you that, that she was, you know, growing in the force sort of just rapidly, randomly? Or did, did were you on board with that story? I was on board, but I know some people... I think she's the one of the three I endeared myself the most to. Mm-hmm. I mean, Finn, I still don't like. The guy every movie's trying to run away, and I'm mm-hmm. tired of it. I think he stops that, for I've heard. Please. I mean, even even Star, I'm just here to get the girl. What The whole galaxy's counting on you, dummy. I mean, for, and then he's just, all he's doing is running away mm-hmm. in Last Jedi. Done with him. Uh, Poe <laughs> Dameron, you take him out of The Force Awakens, the movie doesn't change, really, but he's Although fun. he does blow up the, I, the Star Killer base at the end. I mean, is. he is he does fly the X-Wing that destroys the Star Killer base. So he's Wedge? He's Wedge, <laughs> <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> um, so more, Ray more is lines. the one I find, I guess, <laughs> yeah. the most interesting. More lines. Uh, I Better mean, hair. I guess if the... But we talked about why do people care who her parents is. I guess it's simply because it, that would be the only reason she has Force powers is right. through her hereditary means. I, I think... But I which was never, never cared. But yeah, yeah, it's midichlorians. Yeah. That was established, right? right. <laughs> I well, I you know I technically the midichlorians talk to the wills, yeah. and the wills talk to the force. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I I think the one thing about uh, I, what I always love about Star Wars is not just uh, generational for for the people watching it, but it's generational in terms of filmmaking. And uh, 
the you look at the original Star Wars, there are fade to blacks in the original Star Wars. It actually fades to black a couple times. It's amazing. What? Where, when does it fade to black? Uh, after they decide they're not going to go follow R2 in the night, and then it fades back up on Beru going, Luke, Luke. Um, <gasps> You're right. Yeah, there are actual fades <laughs> to black. Holy crap, you know so much. Because we were doing that in the 70s. Um, yeah. That's why Star Wars is my favorite. Yeah. It, it is it is exemplary of the great 70s filmmaking. It's totally. a product of that. He came out of the, the David whole class Lean, with yeah. the... With the, following David Lean and yeah, running alongside De Palma and Coppola and all those guys. Yeah, they're, they're contemporaries. It just happened to be in space. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Carrie was cast alongside Star Wars. They yeah. were happening simultaneously. Um, but I think my point in raising that up is is Force Awakens, no interest in Fades to Black. It's going at lightning pace. Yes. And the character development, similarly, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Luke has a very slow journey. Ray is accelerated. Everything, because there's a degree of, I think the filmmakers kind of have this caveat of, well, we know Star Wars. We don't have to go on the same long journey that Luke went on. We can accelerate that. Yeah. Uh, and I think I kind of accepted that as I was watching it with Ray. Um, I think the other thing, too, is I accept Ray's journey because she's because um, we haven't gotten the answers yet. Because mm-hmm. I think there's something more going on. And I don't know how much you guys want to get into theories. Um, Go for it. I think we got time for one more. We got time for one more. <laughs> <laughs> Always got time for one more. Um, Always time for one more. Uh, it's the clock in the st- you can't tell, but the clock in the studio broke. So I have no idea <laughs> how long we've been going. It was on I the just wall. checked the camera. Like I it's think right the there, camera's still fell. rolling. Let's go. One more. Right, Believe it or not, this podcast is longer than the Last Jedi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think the. Uh, the, the the interesting I, I think the story hasn't been fleshed out yet and why she is what she is. Um, mm. My theory right now, you know, a month out from release, is that uh, I think she's akin to Anakin. I think she's a creation of the Force, so I think oh. she's more connected to the Force. Oh, that's interesting. You don't think she had? Maybe she didn't have parents, or she didn't have, I, or uh, maybe she didn't have a father like Anakin. Didn't something have like a father, that. Where that kind of thing. It, yeah. yeah, and I think because I think that's cool. The Emperor has always. I think the Emperor was disappointed with Vader. He he had well he was he, he absolutely created him was. and then he got a he got a half a man yeah and so he was trying to well let's get the next best thing I'll get his son mm-hmm. and I think he's always been trying to get back to the source mm. so I, I I wonder if you know he had little seeds planted and because she was close to Kylo Ren that particular moment she got activated that's the Force Awakens oh um, was that it, it to balance out and she just got activated light because there was a closer dark at, at you know person right. nearby. And because there was no So light. Kylo just shows up on Jakku, and that's enough. Well. I mean, that's enough, right? That's enough, yeah. It's close. Yeah. It's a proximity thing. It's, a prox- it, 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 it's, it's, it's a need for balance, because this is supposedly all about bringing balance <laughs> to the Force somewhere. I think I remember <laughs> right. hearing that in a movie. Right. Um, so I, I don't know if that's, you know, I, most of my Star Wars theories in it, uh, it don't prove out. Yeah, so. mine, mine, <laughs> neither do mine. Which I'm so, actually yeah. quite fine with. Oh, I love yeah, being me, wrong. me too. Me yeah. too. Yeah. I'm, I'm it's happy much to be more wrong. fun to get it wrong so. than to be. I, I don't. Uh, which, by the way, we talk about video. this a lot, <laughs> and I will say it again. Uh, that's what I loved about the Last Jedi was yeah. so much that I was like, oh, it's gonna. Nope. Oh, it's gonna. Nope. But that's what I like. <laughs> Ryan Johnson had no interest in making the Star Wars movie we all thought we wanted to watch. So even that's you can right. even read J.J. Abrams' comments, and he's like, they were like, what were your actions? Like, Luke is dark. Like I wasn't. That's J.J. Abrams' reaction. It's like I didn't think he'd be that dark, um, which I think is funny because like, well, what did you think when you set him up on an island by himself and he's ignoring all his friends <laughs> while they fight and die for the freedom of the galaxy? Mm. He's in a dark place, dude. <laughs> like that's what you set up. Yeah, um, yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, I think he kind of some of it. They wrote themselves into a box, and Ryan Johnson had to get him out of it. And it was an interesting. He's like, these are the cards you're dealt. You want to talk about Star Wars? Go. I like that you finally made Ryan Johnson a hero. Thank I think you. Ryan, well, listen, I, I will clearly, Thank you. I will very much say that I'm uh, prejudiced in Ryan Johnson's favor. I produced a movie called, Gold, shameless plug, called Golden Earrings, and he gave us a quote for the poster. Oh, that's about awesome. About 10 years ago. And well, he's a USC grad, fight on. So I, I, I like Ryan Johnson. I, I think absolutely good love, I mean, I know we're going to do uh, Last Jedi next, but I, I love mm-hmm. that movie. I love it for a lot of reasons. But I, I, I love both of them, and I do argue, too, you know, J.J. Uh, Abrams was an executive producer on The Last Jedi. I have a very yeah. hard time believing that he didn't know anything that was going on. I think he just, <laughs> I think the thing was he thought Colin Trevorrow was going to do the nine. Uh, and so he just didn't think it was his mess. <laughs> <laughs> thank God. Actually, yeah. thank God it's not Colin Trevorrow's yes, mess. Yes, I agree. Oh, I was so <laughs> damn happy. He still got a writing credit, though. And he got his shuttle on Galaxy's Edge. You know about that? No. There's, uh, you know, there's the corner where Kylo Ren comes out of the shuttle. 
that shuttle was designed for Colin Trevorrow's episode oh, nine. Wow. And then when they changed directors, what that shuttle apparently was going to be used for was junked. So it was supposed to tie into nine. Wait a minute. So there's the there's the ship there, the big TIE fighter type ship. The type, yeah. That yeah. He comes out of and kind of gives a speech. when That he, ship there. That ship there. Oh, okay. So that was supposed to tie into nine, and then J.J. Abrams didn't use the design. Oh. So now it's exclusive to Oh, all to the that. more reason to go. Yeah, there's a couple weird... Uh, Trevor O leftovers, like the scene between Ray and uh, Poe introducing each other at the Falcon at the end of Last Jedi. That's a Colin Trevor O scene. Like he asked, hey, "Can you introduce them? I need that setup for my movie." Oh wow! And then he's gone. And he's gone. <laughs> so there's, there's weird little <coughs> lingering things that just got left. Wow! By yeah. Colin Trevor. Anyone who's sad about that, just go watch Book of Henry and enjoy yourself. Have I skipped it. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's two more things I want to ask you. So about <laughs> USC. Yes. So how how ingrained is Lucas over there for, as like a as a I guru? Mean, as I mean, guru. I, yeah. I, I'm class of 99, so I can't speak right now, but I mean, I think his influence is pretty damn huge because he yeah. rebuilt the whole school. I just remember um, I, w- I was going to Minneapolis Community College and their film program at the time, and this is like spring 96, and I transferred to uh, fall 97, and I toured all the campuses in L.A. I went to UCLA, I went to USC, and I just remember walking around U- UCLA, and it just like this, and nothing, I... UCLA is fine. I'm, this is not a rivalry thing. Mm-hmm. But it was just, it was kind of spread out. I walked in. They had the same film editing equipment that uh, that they, I had at the community college. They had more of it. Um, they had better screening rooms. But uh, then I got to USC, and it was just this very clean, organized machine, and the campus is laid out very s- straight. And then you get there, and it's like, here's our THX certified leader <laughs> called Norris, <laughs> where the t- the inventor of THX, Tom Holman, will teach you beginning sound. <laughs> and he did. And the first day of class, they show you Star Wars and say, here's the first real Star Wars. Here's the first real Star Wars with the production audio. Oh, wow. And everybody has different Cockney accents, and you can hear the stormtroopers clopping on the wooden floors. And then here's uh, <laughs> Star Wars with the Foley track. Here's Star Wars with the effects track. Here's Star Wars oh with just God. the music. You got to, oh, my God. And they so I was pe- hoping there'd be something like they, that. They oh. peel it back like that. And and so you and that's <clears throat> they use that as your introduction because they know we're of that generation. I don't know if they still do that. But um if they don't, they should go back to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was all film. It was very cool. I mean, I, they, they were incidents like, you know, we, they sh- one time we we're going, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna deconstruct the opening of Apocalypse Now. So they play this Apocalypse Now. It's like this is a rare 70 millimeter dye technicolor transfer print. It's amazing. we only play it once a, you know, once a semester. It was great. They got to the end of the the big helicopter sequence and then suddenly um the film <gasps> slipped in the gate. And oh, it was no. on Harrison Ford, and the film went it, like like a Muppet movie, it just, uh, yeah. and just like Harry, we're all. I mean, we didn't know if we were ready to laugh or cry because it was like, oh, rare print, oh, that's funny. <laughs> like they set it up perfectly, but it was oh. it's ingrained. It's Star Wars is ingrained. There was, I I learned how to edit in the Marshall Lucas editing facility. Oh my gosh, um, which is wow. gone now. Now it's part of the music school because I don't, oh. you know. Um, but it's a, it was all. There and now the new school that the, the buildings I went to school in are torn down, and now there's new, bigger, better buildings that are the Lucas and, Spiel, and Spielberg buildings. So, I mean, the wow. name's on the building, yeah, yeah, and he nice. designed those buildings down to the doorknob, apparently. So, that's it. And I toured the new school when it opened about uh, a few years ago, and I went down to one of the mixing consoles with a tour group, and it was all you know, grads, and it was great. There's a student, he's like, This is you know, 120 channel mixer, memory faders, the whole thing. It's like, It does this and does that. And there's this guy in the back and goes, Are your guys learning on this? Because you're not going to know how to work anything. We don't have anything near that advanced at Universal. <laughs> did you have a teacher named Barnett Kelman? I did not. Oh, okay, he he uh. Directed the movie Key Exchange. Okay. Which no one remembers. I directed the play of it in college. <laughs> and he, he did a bunch of TV. Yeah. And I go down and I act in a student's uh, scene for broadcast news okay. in Barnett Kelman's class. So I go yeah. down and he's working with the directors to direct us in this scene. Yeah. And that guy was amazing. <laughs> like, who, Key Exchange, no one knows. Uh, the yeah. TV, you couldn't. You know, you're not going to say this is a Barnett Kelman movie, but that guy knew. I mean, this. So right there, I went. If this deep, the staff is excellent at USC. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I was impressed. Well, I think it's wow. one of those interesting things. Is you know, it's you're. you're it and goes, everyone's on their phone. And all the kids are sitting yeah. on their phone. I'm like, oh. God, God, I'm sitting there going, I'm getting a free film class. class. Guys, pay attention. This guy is amazing. The, the, the worst one, I went back and just, I saw a van screening of La La Land at the, on campus <gasps> a few uh, a while ago. And... Um, it was, it was like three weeks before it came out, and they did a Q&A, and Leonard Malton teaches that particular class. It's called 466. Oh, cool. It's on Thursday nights. And um, 
they, <laughs> they're clearly were getting ready for the test because they just start, every student had their laptop out and they were transcribing everything the guy was saying. And it was just, you just heard clacks. I mean, it, it was Dolby Atmos <laughs> clacks. Every corner of the theater was just, oh and I was like, God. can't they have one person and just share? Like, this yeah. is ridiculous. It's amazing. Or um, why don't they just turn on the voice recorder? Yeah, or just me- memorize it. I, 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 I remember, I, did, I barely took notes in that. I, I took that class when I was there, and I just, like, you listen to a filmmaker talk about the movie they just make, and they ask you questions about what the filmmaker said about the film you watched. <laughs> How hard is that to remember? <laughs> well, one other thing about your, your history in, uh, in, in the world in the uh, world. is in it the ties world. into Star Wars. You, were, uh, you ran something called the Ultimate Star Wars Timeline from 1998 to 2006. Yeah, and eventually my... you founded a home at theforest.net. I did. So uh, explain what that is for people who don't know. Well, and I... then how a Force Awakens wrecked it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of let it go. Um, but, uh, you know, I, when I was at USC, they gave you a free website. And I had had a, uh, a Word document when, because um, I, w- I had read uh, Star Wars comics all my life. Uh, when my dad, I was like eight, and I, it was behind in my reading level, so my dad's like, well, he's just not, doesn't have anything he's interested in reading. So he took me to the comic book shop and started getting me comics. Hmm. And it was Marvel. Smart dad. Yeah, Marvel 77, issue 77. It was right before Jedi came out, and I, that was my first Star Wars regular comic, and I've pretty much gotten every one monthly since then. Um, and, uh, so when it was pretty easy back in the day, pre, you know, by the time the Marvel land, there was like that three Lando novels, three Han Solo novels and Splinter of the Mind's Eye. That's the EU. Who cares? <laughs> but then suddenly, um, <laughs> there was, you know, uh, heir to the empire and dark empire and tales of the Jedi and the, this thing. And I just, the way my OCD brain worked, I had to keep writing it down where things fit. And then I got to USC and I got a free web page and I like to procrastinate on my homework. So I started uh, figuring out how to put it into the internet. And then slowly that got more and more attention. Um, it ended up at theforest.net. And so uh, it's just a timeline that, that lists everything in the EU up to that point. 2006, I think, is where I left off, 2007. And uh, it has everything in chronological order. So I just t- kind of I get something, I read it, I figure out where it goes. I post it online. That's pretty much it. So um, it's kind of always been tied into Star a lot Wars. Of work. It, you know, and you're it, the guy it, who's spotting inconsistencies, no doubt, more than anybody else. Well, you know, there's there's more. Oh, you know, it's one of those ones when you get to a certain level of any kind of whether you're the best at a sport or you're the best, you're the, the big, one of the biggest fans. You kind of get to that point where you realize, oh, and then there's the other group. <laughs> <laughs> there's like the ninety. You're like maybe I'm ninety nine point five. <laughs> But then there's the other guys and, and, and girls and they're, and nothing against them. I'm friends with a lot of them and they all have, and we all have different specialties too. Um, you know, at, you know, and it's all different areas. There's, there's those fans who love the merchandise and you, mm-hmm. you know, you, you go to, you know, their house and it's just wall to wall. It's like you go to the other guys and they just, they know everything. They've read everything and they have everything memorized. And like, I have some pretty bad recall. Like I don't rem- I've read all the books probably, but I don't think I can recall call all the books um I, I made my note and then i moved on there's some guys i know who just like but this and this and, da, 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 da. and i was like oh yeah 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 you're right absolutely right <laughs> um so um but you know star wars has kind of always been I, I think it took even took me a while growing up to realize i liked movies as much as i like star wars like i it, mm. it, it they, they, they were first i think i just thought i was a, i think it's one of the reasons i took two years off of high school before i went to film school was because I, I I hadn't made the jump to filmmaker. I just thought I liked Star Wars and, mm. and generally was a movie fan. And I was like, oh, no, I really like movies, like all movies. And that was kind of the door that unlocked it. But um, but the funny thing was about the, the EU uh, jumping all over the places we have been um, was that um, when Disney bought uh, the company, I think I said this kind of earlier, they, you know, they – there was this large tapestry of, of novels and there were, you know, they took place 30, 40 years after Return of the Jedi. And, mm. you know, Han and Leah had three kids and one of them had turned to the dark side and become Darth Cadus and Luke and killed Luke's wife. And Luke had a son named Ben and they were all, Luke had a son named Ben. Yes. Not Han. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There was a whole thing that had happened and Chewbacca had died saving one of Han and Leah's kids and a moon fell on him. Um they killed the family dog. It was terrible. Um, <laughs> you know, they... You lost my wife right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there was no way 
I was like, as soon as they, even just Lucas, before he even sold to Disney, before, and they made just the Kathleen Kennedy's coming on board, we're developing more Star Wars. It's like, well, the EU's gone. There's no way. Because you could just no watch. No way there's going to be a giant rabbit in this. Oh. <laughs> Jackson, <laughs> Jackson, Jax is back in continuity, though. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he is. Oh, okay. He's back in, yeah, yeah. There's a Star Wars Kids comic, and he's back in. Oh, I'll be damned. Yeah, for the, actually, for the first time since, like, 1978, he's back in continuity. Wow. Wow. Um, so he's still around. But never made a film appearance. <sighs> not, not yet, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, last question I have then is, and you can, uh, you know, answer with whatever tangents you care to. <laughs> was the was the film what you thought it would be? Force Awakens. Was it more? Was it less? Was it on point? Uh, for me, the Force Awakens was uh, absolutely on point. I I had such a great. W- fantastic experience watching it in the theater and and I you know went a couple times I brought my daughter and you know there, I mean there were so many like moments I, I absolutely love the movie I will say af- as time has passed I see the things that I don't like as much because I when I left the movie the first time I saw it I called my wife <laughs> on the way home <laughs> and I was I was shaking and I was gonna get lunch or whatever and and uh, and I I said and she's like well what what did you think and I said I I I I I think I like it more than The Empire Strikes Back I had the greatest you know and and I don't feel that way at this point but mm-hmm. um but I I do think it's a it's a fantastic movie I think it's a well crafted film I think it's a great um I think it's a great uh, uh film and it captures imagination but it also is a great example of a of a large company uh a large conglomerate sort of going okay let's check all these boxes and let's get all this right and Mm. and they did and and i had a friend of mine uh another friend uh, who's a filmmaker who who said yeah I, I like The Force Awakens. It, it's really the biggest fan film that's ever been made. <laughs> and in a lot of ways, I think that's probably a good assessment of mm-hmm. what The Force Awakens is. But I think they did a great job. Yeah. You're not yeah. going to get solo Ragnarok out of the uh, Kathleen <laughs> Kennedy run <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I think, I think uh, you know, it, Disney did what they needed to do. They needed to reset the board and remind everybody what Star Wars was. And what Star Wars needed to be was a reset back to 77. Mm-hmm. And that format and that formula, which I think is what J.J. was trying to do. And I think, you know, in terms of my expectations going in, I probably wasn't expecting it to adhere quite as literally to that format as it was, <laughs> as it did. But um, I, it was purely a J.J. Abrams Star Wars film, which is definitely what I was expecting. And, I, you know, I loved his his version of James Bond and Alias. I loved I liked his version of Star Trek it, as flawed as it was, because it doesn't always adhere to what Star Trek is, which is, again, a different podcast. But, but mm-hmm. smart move. Hey, alternate timeline. We can do what we want. It was a very smart yeah. move. Um, and, and that would, really makes it very acceptable. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of Star Wars, he he brought the the pacing. He brought the energy. He brought the kind of tactile vibe that you want from a Star Wars film that was missing from the prequels of people interacting with environments and sets and feeling like they exist in the world. He he brought the mystery back to Star Wars too. I, I One of the greatest moments in all the saga for me is Han walking through the hologram of all the stars or where the map where Luke oh, could be. Oh yes, absolutely. And going, oh yeah, I know Luke. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's true. Real. All of it. All of it. I'd, yeah. Still, that scene gives me chills. <laughs> like, still, just gives me the, chills. The skeptic, Absolutely beautiful. The Mister Blaster. Yeah, that he's sitting in the room where buys Obi- religion. Yeah, where Obi Wan had he'd argued against it with Obi Wan, yeah. and he had come. That, that to me is, and that's what makes it Han's journey acceptable, is mm-hmm. because he has come full circle in that, and I think that's lovely. There are J.J. Abrams flaws in there where he's moving a little too fast for his own good, like. Poe, which I think was funny because Ryan Johnson clearly picked up on it. Poe had no sense of military decorum at the end of the movie or they're having the big meeting around the table. Why isn't Leah telling them to go fight the fight? No, it's Poe. Poe is stepping on her. And then Ryan Johnson, I had that was a problem for me. It's very much like <clears throat> Kirk in the Star Trek. He has no idea of military decorum, J.J. Abrams. But Ryan Johnson mm-hmm. picked up on that and turned it into a story point, which was great. Other things like... Leah's never met Ray, but she's going to give her a hug after her husband dies. Not uh, yeah, Chewie. Well, again, you, you uh, heard that, me going I, I will say, even in the first time I saw it, <laughs> that, I, I remember seeing Chewie walking, and you want, and, to and have... you're like, wait, 
Is, is he not gonna? Like, hu- is he not gonna hug? Like Leia? I, am, I am, They're not gonna hug each other. I was ready to weep openly. Like I was. I wanted yeah. the cathartic release yeah. of those two together. And mm. I, 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 I don't. I understand. Okay, you, you're doing a lot. You're making your movie, but the the number of times that JJ goes back and reshoots things and look. Mm. We were talking about how he kind of watches the movie, feels the movie, and then follows avenues and kind of will pick up things. How he did not, and how no one in any room did not pick up on that Leah should hug Chewie in that moment is beyond me. Um, yeah, me too. And and that's probably the, the greatest grievance I have against the film, honestly. Mm-hmm. Well, it goes along my line of no one cared enough that Han was dead. Yeah. Well, you know, they originally did have The Last Jedi was supposed to start with his funeral. Hmm. That was the original. I think it's in, it's in the novel. It's right? in the novel. Yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. reading about that. Telling you the novels. No, I, but I, but I, wacky. I had heard that uh, that that was the case in general. Anyway, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a couple. <clears throat> you, you can even look in the deleted scenes. The yeah. movie doesn't start the way they shot it to start. Yeah, um, it's different. Um, it started with Finn originally. Oh, uh, it, it, it's in the shots in the movie where you come down in the dump after the battle. Uh huh. He was supposed to be wandering around the ship during the battle, going, "What's going on?" And they were like, "Let's just get into the battle and get rid of Comic Ben <laughs> <laughs> walking around yes, in this yeah. weird leaky jumpsuit." That was a smart move. Yeah, that was it's, a very yeah. smart move. But that's your next podcast, actually. Um, I uh, we <laughs> talked about this. Yeah. <laughs> what was your, uh, just or the one, last or the new whole new show entirely? Yeah. I mean, I could do this for a long time, but I know we're gonna wrap <laughs> it up. But I, I do have a question. So we talked about this a little bit on the last episode. Yeah. What is your feeling about because it's in the Last Jedi and it's in the Force Awakens? These lines that are in the script that are both story, both to the character, and also sort of a a line to the fans. Over um, writing, but go ahead. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a brutal plague in filmmaking in general in the mm-hmm. last five years yeah ten years maybe well I think uh, hi uh, you know don't mm. hug Chewy but be sure to like, tell Finn everything we already know about him right right hey, you know, <laughs> no you're the brave one here's what you did the la- we saw it we just saw it well did, did Lucas <laughs> he knows it I know it she knows it why did, are we saying it? didn't Lucas start that with 3PO and and the Ewoks. Tells him the whole. Mm. Tells him all three movies. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But at least in a but, fun but, sort of context, yeah, but instead think, of just I, I, here's I, words. I do think we 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 exist in a problem, and it, it's it's a symptom of Nolan's Batman films and uh, Casino Royale. Oh, where, explain. I love those. Where we, I, I love them too. But I think that because they were successful, they this, we lived in a world where we like to deconstruct our movies and our heroes and our franchises. Like you have to kind of go in and think, what is this? Mm. Like what 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 makes this this what makes Bond Bond what makes Batman Batman what makes Star Wars Star Wars and so you end up kind of asking those questions as a writer and then you end up asking them to your characters and then your characters end up asking them to your audience. Eh, it's um, too much. It's too much. Because it is. even now, I, I agree. No, sadly, because it happens so much in the movies. Even yeah. Marvel does it. Ant Man and the oh, Wasp. Totally. Just what, everything Lawrence Fishburne says is things we already know about him. We got to get that thing. You know, yeah. like we know it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, no, I, he knows yeah. it. We know it. Why are we saying it? No, I mean, I, you, but, you see it even in like uh, Frozen well, Two. They, they, the, the snowman is always going. I don't think we should be doing this. It's like we all know that, but that you, you calling out doesn't make it better. This, but is, I'm, this I'm, isn't I'm, too much of a spoiler right. for Mandalorian. But yeah. I got to bring up my point about this. Is it even then that little scene where? The Mandalorian's hidden away, and two troopers come in to try to take him out. They say they have to say, hey, let's split up, and you go over there, and I'll go over here. Well, first of all, why would you say that? Because you're, you're not being stealthy anymore. And secondly, just do it. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, But little things like that now happen peppered through all these movies where there's not dialogue necessary. In fact, in well, fact it's funny because there's uh, such a lack of dialogue in The Mandalorian that I'm super impressed by that even <laughs> now I look at that little thing and just go, oh, why do I have to get so annoyed by my, that? My favorite um, one is, is in Rogue One where they're sitting around the table doing the briefing. These are always where Star Wars films have their problems. People sitting around tables discussing things and Jin's trying to get her speech out. Yes. And there's one guy and the right speaker goes, what's she trying to say? And one guy on the left side goes, let her talk. And I'm like, what? what, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's very specific. I was like, what, what studio executive put the note that we needed to isolate <laughs> yeah. those voices to explain what was going on in that moment? Just right. let her now, struggle to speak and let her act. I, I do want to clarify Sorry. my question, which is, <laughs> More to, <laughs> uh, although I agree with all of this, <laughs> but but mine was you more straight answer? like with the Last Jedi, where you know let the past die, right. kill it, like that kind of stuff. Because there was stuff like that in the Force Awakens too. Although I, for whatever reason, well, I even Han any. stuff that we say we like yeah. about uh, it's true, all of it. He's looking yes. at camera. Yeah, yeah, he's looking at. You well, know. come on. Yeah, I mean uh, JFK, right? Yeah, it's up to you. Yeah, I mean, mm. it's true. Sometimes it's a nice little moment. Yeah, it's, it does work. It's, I mean, I think yeah. I, I don't know. I personally like it. I was just curious. What... Um, 
I, I think all those things I am reserving judgment until I see the conclusion. Love it. I, I think I kind of have to see, like like I said with Poe, um, his kind of insubordination and like JJ's lack of understanding of military decorum bugged me in Force Awakens. Mm-hmm. Now it's a story point in Last Jedi, and it played out well. Mm-hmm. So I'm, and I, it doesn't bother me as much because I know it's going to be paid off. Right. Um, so a lot of these things I just kind of want to see how, you know, I'll know more on December 19th after oh. I get out of that theater. Uh any any they go in on the nineteenth to come out on the twentieth. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, it's going, I'm going on the nineteenth. Oh, you're going early. That's I'm going on the Thursday. We're going show. in on the nineteenth. Yeah, we're, we're coming out. Yeah. We're going yeah. in on the nineteenth. I, I will on know. The um, is there anything that you've seen in the previews for Rise of Skywalker that that you're like, oh my god, I cannot wait to see? Did you see what the new that... clip today? I'm I I I I've hit the point where I sh- I start. I, I I stopped watching. It. Yeah, I'm I'm there too. Yeah, I, and yeah. honestly, between, like this past week, because uh, I keep up with everything. So on yeah. Monday, I watched a Re- uh, Resistance episode from Disney XD. On Thursday, I played Vader Immortal episode three VR on Oculus. And, oh my God. and then on Friday, there was a new episode of The Mandalorian. And somewhere in between there, I'm like reading, my, I'm catching up with the Star Wars comic books that I've kind of been stashing, waiting for this moment of being immersed. Because um, I kind of, after Solo, I kind of, not because Solo was, I, I, I actually like Solo, but yeah. I just kind of shut Star Wars off. It's like, you know something? It's going to be Marvel. For between now and like the end of summer 2019, it's going to be Marvel. I will just shut Star Wars off and not think much about it. Right. Kind of knowing that once we hit Halloween, it's Star Wars time. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, I, I, and I would just like between it's Star Wars time. It's Star Wars time. He was like, Star Wars over there. Star Wars over there. <laughs> and, and, you know, it kind of lasts all the way through February where we get the last season of Clone Wars, where it's just going to be kind of nonstop, fun, new, exciting Star Wars. And, yeah. you know, because there's, there's, you know, the day after Star Wars or Rise of Skywalker comes out, they're adding a Rise of Skywalker component to the Star Tours ride. That's true. Mm-hmm. And it's like there's just a lot of, whether it's a ride or it's a, wow. bo- you know, there's just a lot of stuff coming out right now. So I just kind of was like, you know, saying, I think I'm, if I had stayed with it, I would have been overloaded right now. Yes. And I rather wanted this enthusiasm where we can talk on a podcast for three or five hours <laughs> <Yeah>. and <laughs> keep going. Anyway, so, if you we're going to take a little break. <laughs> we'll be back. I'm just joking. And it may have been the Rogue One episode, episode you were listening to where we announced that there's a Galaxy's Edge cookbook. There's a lot going on, Brian. There's That's a lot going on. We'll there's a lot going That's on. The, this is the third episode you've been able to bring that back. <laughs> <laughs> How weird is that? There's, there's been other Star Wars cookbooks in the past. Yeah, but a Galaxy's Edge cookbook? I don't think I want the shawarma sausage <laughs> thing at home, but yeah. that's just me. Oh, okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is... Uh, oh, wow, it's actually wow. over? Nine <laughs> movies down. Yeah, that's it. Wow. We got one left wow. before we uh, go, go see Countdown to Nine. Or go see uh, Rise of Skywalker. Come back uh, before the 20th. And, and if if you like this episode, the other ones are just sitting there waiting for you. Yeah, go that's back. right. Well, the I need to go listen to them myself. Yeah, yeah, our solo episode. Our, and they uh, are available just to listen to. You can watch them on YouTube. I mean, they're all over the place. Either one. Mm-hmm. iTunes, yeah. Podbean, you name it. Uh, once again, I'm Paul Preston. I'm Sean Blodgett. And thanks to Brian James Crew. Plugs, what do you got? Uh, you can look up all my films at filmcrew.com. Crew has an extra E on the end, C-R-E-W-E. And you can pretty much find me on all social media that way. How perfect nice. is that, right? Film crew just worked out. Love it, yeah. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook.com slash Countdown to Nine, at Countdown to Nine on Twitter and Instagram. And you can get the show, as uh, Sean mentioned, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, all that nonsense. And, of course, the themovieguys.net. Next up, The Last Jedi and the last episode of Countdown to Nine until we do the Countdown from Nine <laughs> or something where we do a show. we got to do one show after we see this. Oh, yes. They have all the cartoon shows and Mandalorian uh, after all this build up, I mean, yeah, we got to do one more thing. Oh yeah, this. no, we we have to have a wrap up and and talk about the last uh, uh, the rise of Skywalker. Till then, Sean, I love you. I know. <laughs>